part two of our Christmas series, which I've entitled Choosing Joy at Christmas, because ultimately, I think deep in your heart and in mine, we'd actually like to experience that. We would actually like to experience real joy, not the kind of joy that comes or that the world tries to foist on us, but we'd actually really like to experience the authentic joy that is meant to come to us as Christians and followers uh, of Jesus. And so, uh, these two choices that we've been talking about over the last month, choosing gratitude and choosing joy, are two choices that can dramatically change your life. You've been walking with God for 50 years, and yet you haven't really paid attention to uh, these choices. Start paying attention to them, and your life is going to take on a better trajectory. If you're not yet following Jesus, these two choices will lead you to Jesus. Choosing gratitude and choosing joy. And we talked last week about the reasons that we have for joy. We uh, uh, looked at the shepherds. The angels came to the shepherds, gave them three reasons for joy. Uh, fear not. There's no need to fear. Uh, we'll talk about that today. Uh, salvation has come uh, was the second reason. And then the third reason is that we are waiting, but not forever, uh, meaning that Jesus is coming again. And if you're having a hard time finding a reason to celebrate Christmas, just start thinking about Jesus' return. Because that's what, the first, that's what Christmas was. It was his, his coming. But he's coming again. He's coming again. And the most often repeated command in Scripture is fear not. And that is the title uh, of, of our message today, uh, the subtitle, Fear Not. Choosing joy at Christmas, fear not. Scholars tell us that there are 365 mentions of that command from God to His people in the Scriptures. Interesting, isn't it? we got 365 days. We all know how that works. One for each day. Why? Because fear is nothing new. Uh, we are definitely living in times where fear and anxiety are getting a lot of the limelight and all of that, blah, blah, blah. But it's not new. This has always been here because this is the human condition. The human condition is to be filled with fear. You're not born righteous experiencing the peace of God. You are born a sinner, and that ought to scare all of us right to the presence of God. Now, that God says it over and over and over. Can you remember when you were growing up? Some of you, that's getting further and further along, but uh, maybe you can reach back into your memory bank and think about it, or for those of you who are growing up, what is the most often repeated command of your parents? Clean up your room. Clean up your room. Pick up your dishes. My, my favorite is turn off the lights. Turn off the lights. There is no party. Turn off the lights. Turn off the lights. I'm not concerned about my electric bill. Just turn off the lights. Can you please turn the light off? And by the way, turn the light off. Turn off. Did you turn the lights off before we left? Are you getting the picture of kind of how it works in our car if we're driving somewhere or if you're at our house? Turn off the lights. Where'd dad go? He's, turning, he's doing his rounds. He's turning off the lights. Turning off the lights. Oh, don't worry about the lights. Dad will turn those off. Maybe for you, it's clean up your clothes. My brother needed to be reminded that his dresser wasn't the floor. <laughs> like, uh, it just clothes everywhere. Like, can I step here? Do, do I, what do I do? How do I, how do I get here? You know, if my brother would have had a different disposition uh, growing up, we would have actually thought the rapture happened, but we knew better uh, than, you know, piles of clothes laying there because he was a bit on the hard side back then. Uh, but nonetheless... What is the most often repeated command? It, that, that helps us understand what God is saying. Fear not. God knows that fear is knocking on the door of your heart each and every day. He knows that. And so he tells us, fear not. Chapman University just finished uh, their uh, ninth consecutive year of what they call the Survey of American Fears. Uh, I've listed them there 
uh, in your notes, if you're following on the app or if you've got the paper notes uh, this morning, they are there. Uh, they released it on October 14th of this year, and we're just going to run through them. These are the top 10 things Americans are either afraid of or very afraid of. These are some other semblance of them. Uh, number one, corrupt government officials. That came in at 62.1%. Uh, of American people are afraid or very afraid of that. Uh, number two, people I love becoming seriously ill. Uh, number three, Russia using nuclear weapons. Uh, number four, people I love dying. Uh, number five, the U.S. becoming involved in another world war. Number six, pollution of drinking water. Number seven, not having enough money for the future. Number eight, economic or financial collapse. Number nine, pollution of oceans, rivers, and lakes. And number 10, biological warfare. Top 10 things Americans are afraid of. So chances are, as you have uh, interacted with Americans in 2022, these are some of the fears that reside behind the rough exterior or all of the things that, you know, we cover our fears up with. And by the way, everybody has fears. It's not true. You, you'll never meet a, well, I'm not afraid of anything. That's just not true. You're not, you're not an exception to the rule of humanity. You have fears. In fact, if that's you, it very well could be that your greatest fear is people finding out that you actually have a fear. Otherwise, God's wasting his breath. But God over and over and over and over told his people to fear not. We see that all throughout the Old Testament. And then we come to the end of Malachi. Where God says, if you don't obey me, I will smite the land with a curse. And that's just the covenant nature of our God. If you will, then I will. That, that's the covenant-keeping nature of our God. So think about the Israelites. End of Malachi comes, and until we get to Matthew 1, there are four centuries of silence from God. And the last thing that God said to his people was, lest I smite you with a curse. I don't know if some of those generations began to maybe think, maybe God has cursed us, maybe God has left us. I would think probably that that's probably true at some point, which makes Christmas all the more sensational. Because after four centuries and uncounted funerals of people who were born without God saying anything new and then dying without God saying anything new, finally, we get the Christmas story. And it doesn't begin with Joseph and Mary. It begins with a man named Zechariah. And if we turn to Luke chapter 1 and verse 13, it says, the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your petition has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you will give him the name of John. That's John the Baptist. John, the assemblies of God was coming later. Luke chapter 1. I'm kidding. Uh, verse 30. Is that in the Bible? Really? Uh, Luke chapter 1 and verse 30, to Mary, the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. In Matthew chapter 1 and verse 20, to Joseph, he says, but when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And then in Luke chapter 2 and verse 10, the angel said to them, do not be afraid. This is to the shepherds. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. So God has been silent for 400 years. And what is his message upon, upon reacquainting, if you will, his voice to his people? Remember what I've always said. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Because these are Jews on the eastern fringe of the Roman Empire. They hate the Romans, but the Romans occupy their land. They want nothing more than to be free from the Romans. And Jesus comes and says to the Jews, he says, you have nothing to be afraid of. I have not left you. I am Emmanuel, God with you. Now there's a, a difference between anxiety and fear. Uh, and uh, just for uh, clarity's sake, uh, anxiety is, is definitely a part of fear, but anxiety isn't really well-defined. 
And so if you're somebody who has anxiety uh, or who has struggled with that, you, you are very theoretical. Your mind is full of theory. This could happen and this could happen and then this will happen and then this will happen and then this will happen and then this and then this and then this and then this. That's what your mind is doing when you're filled with anxiety. Fear has a, a definitive object upon which it is focused. So how, what does that look like? Well, if I go hunting alone... I can have anxiety about seeing a grizzly bear. That anxiety turns to fear when I see a grizzly bear. That's what happens. That's why you should hunt in pairs. And always make sure that the person with you is slower than you so she can run faster, right? I mean, that's, that's kind of how that goes. You've heard me say it before. I'd much rather hunt uh, with other people. I think, number one, I think it is wiser. I'm not opposed to hunting by myself. Uh, I think it is more fun. But that's another reason. Uh, <laughs> So anxiety and fear go together. If you're somebody struggling with anxiety, maybe that'll help you to understand your, your anxiety is focused on a bunch of stuff that isn't happening, might not ever happen, and you, but you're consumed with it. And so, and believe me, I know, I know. So let's think about some of the, those those fears that we have. We listed the top 10 for Americans, but what about the fears of things like your kids growing up? that scare anybody? If it doesn't scare you, it scares us. Uh, <laughs> some people are afraid of death. Afraid of death. Some people are afraid of being alone. Some people have a great fear of a potential report from the doctor. It's a real, it's a real thing. Some of us struggle with fears of the lack of money, having enough money to cover all the bases. We can fear the adversity that affects our livelihood, all of the struggles and the trials of life. We can fear big government. We've already said that. Uh, not being loved by anybody, that fear of rejection. We can fear disease. If I get that disease, what's going to happen? Well, let's spend the next decade of our lives being concerned if we get that, right? Anxiety. That's how it works. We can be afraid of the dark. Like I told the first service, if you're afraid of the dark, I just want to calm you uh, today, first of all, that's a very real fear, but don't be afraid. The boogeyman is with you. Um, so <laughs> uh, isn't that great? Uh, there's an insight into this little twisted mind. Uh, <clears throat> where was I? Yeah. Uh, the fear of spending hol the holidays alone. That's a, that's a very real fear for some people. It's just that, 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 that aloneness. There's all kinds of fears that we could go over and over and over the fears that are there. But the point is today, and we're going to drive this home, fear not. And I want to challenge you with this. Many times we think about fear and we think what I need to conquer fear is courage. And I want to take your thinking and kind of turn it on its head. If you are a person who is struggling with anxiety and fear, what you may not need is courage. What you may need is joy. In fact, when you find joy, you'll find courage. But if you keep skipping joy and just looking for courage, you're going to keep falling flat on your face. you got to find some joy, and we're going to unpack that today. But let's go to Luke chapter 2. We read verses 8 through 11 and kind of dealt with them last week. We're going to start in verse 8 again today, but we're going to read through verse 20. So here we go, verse 8 of Luke chapter 2. In the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you you will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger or a feeding trough. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among men with whom he is pleased. When the angels had gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, let us go straight to Bethlehem then and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. So they came in a hurry and found their way to Mary and Joseph and the, and the baby as he lay in the manger. And when they had seen this, they made known the statement which had been told them about the child. And all who heard it 
wondered at the things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary treasured all these things, pondering them in her heart. The shepherds went back, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen, just as had been told to them. So in first century uh, in the first century Roman Empire, where, where, where Palestine was located, where Israel was, poets and orators, people who would speak to the masses, they would often uh, announce with great fanfare the coming of someone who would, who would be the, 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 the Caesar, who would be the emperor. And so God does something very familiar to the Jews. They had seen this type of thing before. What was unfamiliar is that the angels of heaven were doing it at night. And so the angel comes and says, Behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. A Savior has been born for you today. So this whole idea of fear not, this is about choosing joy instead of choosing fear. Four things that, uh, that we have here that can help us, and these are, these are very boots on the ground. These are things that you can do, like you have to, you can put them into practice right now. So number one, focus on what God is doing. Focus on what God is doing. The shepherds, they were tending their sheep, then what did God do? He came and he spoke to them, and what did they do? They started to think about what God was doing. You and I need to understand that God is often working where we least expect it. He is often working where we least expect it. Just go back to uh, the Jews crying out from their Egyptian captivity. And uh, as they're crying out to the Lord, it says that the Lord heard their cries, and God did not come and begin to work in Egypt in the camp of the millions of Jews that were there. He didn't do that. He went somewhere where there was one Jew by himself, one Hebrew, the backside of the wilderness, tending sheep with livestock, thinking about whatever that day, and then God lights a bush on fire. Not going to turn into a grass fire, it's the wilderness, okay? So, but then the bush is not consumed, and that's what gets his attention, and God speaks to Moses about going to Egypt and setting the Israelites free. You see, it was an unexpected place. All the millions of Jews in Egypt, they're wondering where God is. He's talking to somebody about you on the backside of the wilderness. Think about the Christmas story and how scandalous the, the events really were. God was working with pregnancy with an unmarried couple. Now, we know there was no sexual immorality here. We know that Mary was a virgin. That's scandalous. First of all, if you're having sexual relations outside of marriage, that is sin. There's no other word for it. It's sin. That's not my opinion. The God of the universe has so established that. That is sin. It's a sin against God. And yet Mary and Joseph, because of, of their willingness to, wor to work with God and their obedience, they had to be falsely accused. And you know they were their entire, the, the entire life of Jesus. They were accused of, of, of being immoral people. But God chooses to work through an unmarried couple. Would that be okay with you and me in the 21st century? Probably not. We'd have to get used to the idea. I mean, if a teenage girl comes in here pregnant, first of all, we're going to love her and we're going to shower her and drown her in God's grace. But we wouldn't be thinking, oh, man, the Holy Spirit did it again. I can promise you that. We'd be looking for that sucker. That's exactly what we'd be doing. He, he chose, it uh, by all accounts, a teenage girl. Really? You've been around teenage girls? And I love, I love teenage girls. I have one. Listen, they're awesome. But they're teenage girls. In fact, let's just, let's just say that, that Joseph would have been a teenager. A teenage boy, I think that would have been a worse predicament. He chose a teenager. Let's just settle there. What was God doing working in unexpected places to fulfill what he had said he would do? He, he, didn't go to the, he, he didn't go to Jerusalem, the holy city. He went to Bethlehem, the city of David. He didn't go to a palace. He didn't go to the governor's mansion. He went to a barn. 
He didn't, he didn't talk to the, to, the, uh, to, to, the, to the city mayor of Bethlehem. He talked to the shepherds who were the lowest rung of the societal ladder. You see, God was working in unexpected places, and God takes the attention of the shepherds, and he says, look at what I'm doing. Friend, if you are struggling with fear, it is in part due to the fact that you are not focused on what God is doing. You're focused on everything else around you. You are focused on circumstances. You're focused on things that God doesn't want you focused on. That's just true. A couple of things. Letter A in your notes, God is saving people. Focus on that when you're afraid. That God is at work. He's saving people. He's redeeming people. He, those people that you're afraid of, I want you to remember today and focus on the fact not of what they're doing to you, but that God is reaching out to them to redeem them and to save them. God is working. And he is saving people. And let her be. God is keeping his promises. God has promised. He had, he had promised that he would come. Jesus promised that he would come again. He had, he had gone ahead to prepare a place for us so where he is there, we can be also. And listen, not everybody goes to heaven. In fact, there's very few that go to heaven. But it's everybody's choice. Broad is the path that leads to destruction. Narrow is the way that leads to eternal life, Jesus said. And few there are that find it. That's the truth. And so what's God doing right now? Let me tell you, if you're not a follower of Jesus, I'll tell you exactly what God is doing right now, and you need to get focused on it. He is reaching out to you to redeem your life today right here in this room by telling you the truth, that he came that first Christmas not to deliver you from politicians, but to save your soul and to deliver you from sin. He made a promise that he would, and he has come to do it. Focus on what God is doing. If you're aware, I love that Pastor Steve read these Celebrate cards today. Why do we want to do that? Because this helps us to focus on what God is doing. Secondly, if we're going to get past fear and choose joy, we've got to listen to what God says. Listen to what God says. Listen, the, the news is meant to fill you with fear. The news used to be about getting us necessary information. Now, the news is all about, and don't lie to yourself, the news is all about filling you with fear. That is their objective. That is the objective of the media. Not to give us necessary information, but to fill us with fear. God doesn't want you or me filled with fear. He wants us filled with the truth of the life of his word. Turn the news off and start listening to the good news. Start listening to the word of God. Get the word of God. Get you some new neural pathways. Dig some new trenches in your brain. That's what happens, by the way, with new habits. Start doing it. Dam up those old, filthy, nasty pathways that take you to focusing on circumstances that are filling you with fear and start listening to what God says. What did the shepherds do? They stopped tending their sheep so they could listen to what God had to say. You and I need to do the same. we got to listen to what God says. And if you're wondering what God might look like while he's doing this, here's an assignment for you. Go home today or while you're at lunch. Get out your smartphone or your tablet or your smart TV or whatever, whatever it is, and go to YouTube and then just type these words in, listen to me, Linda. Some of you have seen it. A little Hispanic boy, his, 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 his grandma's about ready to give him a papal and smack his tuchus. And he is just sitting there and his grandma's name is Linda. Listen to me, Linda. Listen to me, Linda. Linda, 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 listen to me. And sometimes I just wonder if that's not what God is doing. Listen to me, Ken. Listen to me, Ken. Listen, listen, listen to me, Ken. Listen to me, Ken. Listen to me. Put whatever accent on there you got to. Listen to what God is saying to you because the good news, Jesus didn't give his life on Calvary so you could live decades filled with fear. He died to set us free, and instead of looking for courage, we need to choose joy. And the good news will bring you great joy, just like it did with the shepherds. But then what do we got to do? Well, number three, we got to act on what God says. Don't only listen to it, but act on what God says. Verse 16, 
They came in a hurry and found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in a manger because they said, hey, let's go see what God has said. Let's, let's do what he said. Go to the city of, da- of David. Go to Bethlehem and see this thing which God has done. Act on what God has said. This is Christianity. Christianity isn't listening to what God said and stopping there. It's listening and then acting on it. In fact, that's what the scriptures say. James chapter 1 tells us, verse 22, beginning with verse 22, don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourselves. For if you listen to the word and don't obey, it's like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself, you walk away, and you forget what you look like. Jesus said it this way in Matthew chapter 7. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew and slammed against that house and it fell and great was its fall. So, let me just ask you, What has God been saying to you? Are you acting on it? Because if all we're going to do is listen to God, that's not going to get the fear out of our life. We listen to what he says, and for the joy of what he has said, we do what he says. We act on it. And this begins to cultivate joy, but you've got to make that choice. I can't make the choice for you. I can't choose joy for you. You can't choose joy for me. The shepherds chose to act on the good news that brought great joy. They chose to go and and then they went and they experienced all that God had for them. And how many of us are missing out on what God wants to do in us and through us because we refuse to act on what he has said because we got no faith. Don't I'll just tell you what it is. It's not that, well, you've got this and your personality is this. You have no faith and you're being disobedient. There, I said it to myself. Do you feel better? Oh, no, I didn't. I said that to you too. That's what it is. And we got to act on what God has said. And finally, number four, praise God. Or Maybe you want to add add this word. I would put it in there as well. Thank God, because I think they go together. This goes to the gratitude thing. This is where your index cards. I gave you 100 index cards a couple weeks ago to fill out, 100 things to be thankful for. And I didn't fill them out. I told you to fill those out. Why? So that you can not just choose gratitude, but that you can choose joy. Because when you begin to focus on all the things you have to be thankful for, It changes everything. The shepherds were not wrapped up with their low social standing anymore. They weren't wrapped up with, 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 with all of the stuff that was going on in the Roman Empire. They weren't wrapped up with any of that. Why? Because they listened to what God said. They took action based on what God had said. And it says they went thanking and praising God. And friends, you and I need to get in that mode. This is the antidote to fear in our lives. We got to choose some joy. Choose joy. And it's encapsulated in all of these things. Look what the psalmist said. Psalm 100, verse 4. I like the way the message says it. Enter with the password, thank you. Make yourselves at home talking praise. Thank him. Worship him. There it is. Psalm 16, verse 11 says, You will make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand, there are pleasures forever. In the presence of God, there is fullness of joy. And for lack of a better term, maybe the best way to describe joy is delighting myself in God. When I choose to delight in God, not delight in, you know, in my bank account or in my, my job or delight even in you or delight in, in politics or delight in this, that's not going to bring me joy. But when you delight yourself in the Lord, that is what joy is all about. That's where we find the delight, the joy, the satisfaction that only God can bring. But it's a choice. I have to choose joy. 
yeah, good things can happen to me, and that was we said last week, and that will elicit joy in my heart. But the kind of joy that we see at Christmas was not about external circumstances. It was about people making a choice to hear what God said, to act on what God said, because they were focused on what God was doing. If there's fear in any part of my life, you, you can know this. God, God wants that out of your life. God wants that out of your life. Because we know that fear is destructive to us physically, spiritually, emotionally, damages relationships, does all kind of horrible stuff. But find, gra- choose gratitude. Choose to give God thanks. I don't have anything to be thankful for, kid. I'm, I'm sorry, did Jesus die on Calvary and did you put your faith not in what you can do but in what he did? Then that's a great starting place for you. And you'll find joy when you start giving God thanks, starting with salvation. Give him thanks because you don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. But Jesus came nonetheless that we might not die in our sin. Christmas shows us that joy is more than happy, happy, joy, joy, happy, happy, joy. It's more than a song. It's more than a feeling. It's a choice we make. It is a choice that we make and it is a weapon that God has given us to fight fear. Jesus was a man. Again, we go to Hebrews, who for the joy set before him. What were his external circumstances? Calvary was looming. The cross was coming. The torture. He was about to be murdered, and he knew it. And he chose not to focus there, but on what God was doing. He had heard that God said, give your life as a ransom for people. And he acted on that. And then what did he say? Father, I thank you for these you have given to me. And later he would say, yet not my will, but yours be done. In the person of Jesus, we find consummate joy. And if you're going to try to find joy anywhere else this Christmas, you're going to be disappointed. Because joy starts not with trees and presents and garland and all that, which is awesome and fantastic and wonderful. And I love it all. But it's worthless without Jesus. We don't need any of that to celebrate Christmas. What we need is Jesus. We can choose to delight ourselves in God no matter the circumstances. Now, let me just provide some full disclosure for you today. Friday, I had uh, a thing that, uh, that I had to do, got to do. I guess I got to do it. I got to do it. it. It was great. But I changed my shirt five times on Friday. You want to know why? Because of anxiety and fear of what was coming. Five times. It's the first time that's ever happened to me in my life. Of course, everything went fine and dandy. Yesterday, just meditating, preparing for today, just with the Lord, it was just like this. What is that, Ken? Where's that coming from? And all of a sudden, all of these things we've talked about today just came screaming to me. Because my anxiety was coming from being focused on what was coming, not on who was already here. It was coming based on some things that could happen instead of listening to the report that Emmanuel is with me. And it could have been a different situation on Friday. And so I've got some growing to do is what I'm trying to tell you. And I want this Christmas to be different for me. Because I want to experience joy in ways that I never have at Christmas. And I've had a lot of good Christmases. I'm just one of those guys that has. It's been great. But I want some new and fresh joy that can only come from Jesus. And I think that there's probably many of us here in the room today who could identify. Because there's anxieties and there's fears 
and there's circumstances in your life that are presenting you with fear or joy. And we can either try to walk the road of fear and anxiety and just get through December, just get to New Year's Day and it'll all be over. No, it won't. Or you can say, God, I'm tired of running from fear and I'm ready to stand and I'm just going to choose joy. Let, the, let that stuff come. I'm going to choose joy. And, and these four simple things we talked about today and begin to, to walk them out in our moment-by-moment -moment existence in life. These are things that will help us choose joy this Christmas. As I said before, Jesus didn't come to die on Calvary so that you could be filled with fear. He came that you might experience His joy because the joy of the Lord, that's your strength. That's your strength. Will you stand with me this morning? I'm going to pray for you before we go today. Because God's command to us has not changed. It's been 2,000 years since the first Christmas. God continues to say to us, fear not. In the midst of all that we're hearing in the news, in the midst of all the circumstances that are, that are going on, in the midst of all the financial crises that we're, that we're facing, in the midst of, uh, of, of all of our relational messes that, that might exist, God is still saying, fear not for I am with you. And this week, as you navigate this week, I want you to, to think of Emmanuel, God with us. I want you to say it differently. I want you to not say Emmanuel, God with us. I want you to say Emmanuel, God with me. Because that's what it means. God is with me. I have nothing to fear. The worst that the world can do is take me out physically. I could die. That's the worst that the world can do. But do you know what the promise of the Scriptures is? The world actually helps if they do that. They help fulfill God's greatest goal for every human life. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. To live as Christ, to die as gain. And if death is the worst the world's got to offer, what do I have to fear? Because death for a follower of Jesus, if you're not a follower of Jesus, different story. But for a follower of Jesus... Death is the entry into eternity. There's nothing to fear. You're right with God. So let's pray today. And if you have specific fears as I pray, I want you to just take those to the Lord and say, God, here's my fear. Here's this mess. Here's this thing. Here's this. Here's that. Jesus, today we come to you. And Lord, as we reflect on Christmas and the first Christmas when you came as a baby in a manger, we're reminded of the joy that's, that was there for Mary and Joseph as parents and, and for the shepherds as they came a couple years later for the, the, the Magi as they would come and offer you gifts. Lord, there was, there was joy everywhere. And yet somehow we have been maybe suckered into believing that the joy is all about the external stuff. It's all about what the world has to offer us. And that's why we're so disappointed, why we can't find no satisfaction. And so, God, reorient our hearts today. Reorient our minds. Help us to walk these things out, Lord, to be focused on what you're doing, to, to do the hard things and listen to what you're saying, act on what you're saying, to, to give you thanks in the most difficult of situations. Lord, may we be people who are filled with joy because we're making that choice to delight ourselves in you no matter what's going on in life. God, I need your help. And there are others in this room whose hearts are open to you today who need your help with this. So as we go from this place, just speak to us over and over and over again this week. Fear not, for I am with you. Fear not, fear not. And Lord, may our hearts be encouraged and may joy overtake our hearts and minds. This Christmas season, I pray. In your precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you as you go today, choosing joy.